<coughs> Welcome everybody, my name is Fabio Gattucci, I am a professor here at the Department of Science and a member of the organizing committee of, of, the, of the third <coughs> Ithaca workshop. The <coughs> University of Pisa and the Computer Science Department of that university are very pleased to be the host of this third edition of the workshop. <clears throat> it's true that along the years, algebraic structure played a pivotal role in uh, computer science. Uh, let's just mention uh, data types in general. And at the same time, computer science has been uh, a source of interesting problems for uh, <clears throat> people dealing with uh, algebraic structures. So the idea is that uh, uh, we are pleased because we hope that uh, this event will be able to foster further this dual tradition. So let me thank everybody again for being here and let me pass the mic to Beppe Meter for a proper introduction. Th thank you. Thank you very much. I will take just a, a few minutes of your time uh, just to introduce uh, for uh, people that doesn't know, maybe people at home with the YouTube streaming channel, um, what is Ithaca and uh, what is, uh, how it was born and uh, what's, uh, what we're going to do next maybe so uh, Ithaca we were uh, some fellows uh, in um, Edinburgh in uh, 19 uh, in uh, 2019 at the city meeting the national city meeting and uh, we um, talking together we found out that there were many people Italian people young Italian people studying category theory in many aspects of category theory around and didn't know each other and we we, we thought it was a pity not to, to know each other not to, to have a network of people uh, that uh, could uh, get relation and can take advantage of uh, knowing other people doing the same stuff or similar stuff together. So this was a very, very simple uh, uh, start. And uh, we, we decided to, to try to connect all this, all these people. And uh, we, we don't want to represent anyone. We just want to, 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 to recognize each other and uh, try to do mathematics together. And uh, this is what uh, we, are, uh, we started to do. And uh, we um, founded this community, I would say, uh, of free thinking, free thinking people around the world. Uh, um, Itaca stands, stands for uh, uh, Italian category theories, but we are not just not all Italian and not all category theorists. So it's <laughs> maybe an improper name, but uh, the, the idea is that uh, uh, we, we, we somehow we well, the, 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 this question, this uh, this fact is serious. Um, in, in Italian uh, community, uh, academic community in category theory. Uh, does not support properly young uh, people. And this is, uh, I think, is an issue. Uh, other communities around the world in, uh, in mathematics and uh, in physics and so on do this, support uh, the, um, the junior researcher. And uh, so this was one of the main reasons to, to start this. The, the, the way is still long for this, but we are doing our... Uh, our um, <coughs> our meetings uh, at least once a year we try to meet uh, in presence uh, using uh, the fact that people go to to to, to get their parents and families uh, in christmas or other other <laughs> italians do this many <laughs> very often and uh, and we are organizing also, also seminars online uh, we have uh, uh, a school of category theory uh, with the course uh, which is uh, recorded is available on YouTube in, in Italian. And uh, so you can check, uh, check it out on, uh, on the website. I think that's enough. Because, uh, 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 so I, I'm just waiting a few seconds to uh, the seat and uh, therefore then I can introduce the first speaker of today. Of course, uh, last but not least, I would like to thank uh, very warmly, um, Fabio and the Department of Informatics, because uh, I, I was saying that the Italian mathematicians somehow are not so sensitive for these things, but uh, I think the computer scientists are, <laughs> no, are, are yes, are, are more um, helpful in this sometimes. And so uh, I really thank uh, and the Department of Informatics of Pisa and uh, everybody. Okay, so. So, I think we can start with the, with the real thing, all right? So, 
The first speaker of today is, uh, is Marco Abadini. And we talk about the common audacity of coalgebras and various functors over sets. Thank you. you already had the mic. Yes. So. Okay. Should I select it? Come? See? Uh, Marco, I remind you that you have uh, roughly 25 minutes plus uh, five minutes of questions. Okay, can I enlarge? Um, how was it? Um, was it? Was it? Okay. Okay, thank you, Beppe, for the introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be here and to present this joint work with uh, Ivan Di Liberti. The, the motivation uh, stems from modal logic. Uh, so classical modal logic extends uh, classical propositional logic by adding to uh, unary operators, diamond that expresses possibility and box, Necess uh, it is necessary that P, together with appropriate rules. Uh, now, like, just like algebras of classical propositional logic are Boolean algebras, the algebras of model logic are model algebras. And these are, and these are a model algebra is a Boolean algebra with a unary operation box that satisfies, well, that distributes over finite meets. So, Box of one is one, and box of x meet y is box x meet box y. And diamond is definable from these. And uh, <clears throat> I want to draw the attention on the fact that all the axioms are equational. So uh, all the axioms of Boolean algebras are equational. Um, and also these two, these two axioms, equ equational means we have an identity um, that is, uh, between two terms that is universally quantified. And this, um, this allows to use, sorry, so that's modal algebras form an equational class, so a variety of algebras. And so the powerful techniques of universal algebra apply. And I will come back to this point later. And to represent modal algebras, one can build on, uh, on top of stone duality. So stone duality for Boolean algebras states that Boolean algebras um, can be represented via stone spaces. So there's a dual categorical equivalence with compact house of spaces with a basis of closed open sets. And, <clears throat> and jonsson tarski duality uses this uh, uh, stone duality to represent model algebras and they are dual to descriptive frames. So these are stone spaces with a certain binary relation. So the accessibility relation that satisfies certain properties. And among these properties, we have that for every point of the space, the, the set of points in relation with it is closed. So an accessibility relation. So uh, we can define a function from X to the set of closed subsets of X. Um, and so an accessibility relation can be defined equivalently as a certain function from X to the set Vx X, satisfying certain properties. Now, what are these properties? Well, um, they can be um, neatly described. If we topologize the set of closed subsets of X with uh, the Viatorius topology, then R uh, can be described as a continuous function from X to V of X. So these certain proper these properties here are equivalent to this function to be continuous. Okay, and so this brings us to the uh, to the realm of coalgebras. And here, uh, if you have an endofunctor, so just an endofunctor uh, on a category, 
by a coalgebra, I mean uh, an object X of C and a morphism F from X to F of X. So uh, there's a natural notion of morphism of coalgebras given by this square commuting. And well, the Vietori's construction um, gives rise to an endofunctor <clears throat> on the category of stone spaces and continuous functions. And a descriptive frame can be identified, as we said before, uh, with a continuous function from X to the Vietori space of X. And this is just a coalgebra for the Vietori endofunctor. So, <clears throat> uh, Jonson Tarski duality can be described as uh, uh, as follows: the category of of model algebras is dually equivalent to the category of coalgebras for the Vietori functor on stone spaces. Okay. Now <clears throat> I'm interested in an extension of this duality from stone spaces, with our, which are certain compact Hausdorff spaces, to the category of compact Hausdorff spaces and continuous function. Uh, and the Vettori's functor extends to an endofunctor on compact Hausdorff spaces. So the Vettori's uh, space of a compact Hausdorff space is still compact Hausdorff. Okay, and <clears throat> by some duality, the dual of the category of stone spaces uh, is the category of Boolean algebras, which is a variety of algebras. So in particular, it's, mona it's monadic over set. And something uh, analogous happens for the larger category of compact Hausdorff spaces. The dual is monadic over set with a monadic functor given by uh, the representable functor. For example, you can choose the unit interval, zero one. So, so compact Hausdorff spaces are dual to a variety of algebras, infinitary, so there are Operations of infinitary, infinitarity. Okay, this was proved proved by Daskin. And now we want, we are interested in lifting this to coalgebras, so to model logic. And so, <clears throat> by what I said before, the category of coalgebras for the Vietori's uh, functor on stone spaces has a dual, which is uh, which is the variety of model algebras. So in particular, is monadic over set. Well, we can use the tools of universal algebra. And the question is whether the, um, also something similar happens for compact Hausdorff spaces. So is the, if you take the coalgebras for this Vietoris functor, is the opposite monadic over set? So is it, or equivalently, is it, dual to a, a variety of infinitary algebras. And so we, we, would, we would like to, to have a, a proof of this fact that uses categorical, uh, categorical means rather than um, algebraic, uh, uh, taking an algebraic signature and equations because we didn't want to commit to certain uh, specific choices of the signature. And so, <clears throat> okay, so we use, the, the answer would be yes. And to do so, well, first of all, given an end of functor F, we have a forgetful functor from the coalgebras of F to C. So uh, on object, you take a, an object, so a coalgebra, and you map it to the underlying set X. Uh, sorry, object X. And so the strategy to prove that uh, coalgebras of Vietoris op is monadic over set is to, to take this uh, forgetful functor, show that it's monadic, and then compose it with this other monadic uh, functor that we know from Duskin to be monadic and then somehow prove that the composition is still monadic. Now, <clears throat> uh, of course, usually monadic uh, functors do not compose, I mean, the composition of monadic functors is not monadic, 
but under certain conditions, it is the case. So, and we use one of these sufficient conditions. So if, um, if F and G are two monadic functors and the monad T on D that is associated to the first one preserves reflexive co equalizers, then the composite is monadic. Okay. And in our case, uh, we, we are in this situation where we have uh, the, the opposite of this uh, forgetful functor. We want to understand when this is the comp a certain composition is monadic, and this is the condition. So if F is a functor that preserves limits of omega cochains, so, <clears throat> so a chain uh, um, ordered like the, um, the negative integers, and it, if it preserves also co-reflexive equalizers, then for every monadic functor from, from C op to D, the composite of this, uh, the, the forgetful functor and the, and the functor G is monadic. Uh, so how do we use the, uh, how do we use the hypothesis? So the fact that F preserves limits of omega cochains is used to, to prove that this functor has a, a, has a left adjoint. Okay, now with the op, I'm getting confused. Uh, but okay, yes, as a, a left adjoint, and so is monadic. It's, it's enough to show that it's a, it has a left adjoint. And then, and also this hypothesis gives us a construction of the left adjoint, and we use this construction and the fact that F preserves co-reflexive equalizers to prove that the monad on C op uh, here preserves reflexive co-equalizers. Okay. Okay, there's also a version with uh, algebras instead of co-algebras, but we just needed this for co-algebras. And so we apply this to, to what we wanted. So uh, if we take the opposite of the category of co-algebras for this uh, Vietoris functor on, stone, on compact Hausdorff spaces, this is monadic over set. And, and yes, we, we, we show that the hypothesis of the previous theorem are satisfied. Well, they were actually already been shown. Uh, and so the, this composite um, of the forgetful functor and of the Duskin monadic functor is monadic. And analogous results hold for certain variation on the Vietoris construction, namely the lower Vietoris and upper Vietoris. And, and also analogous, analogous results hold for a positive model logic. So positive model logic is model logic uh, without negation. And it has, um, it, it has some, some algebras, which are positive model algebras. These are bounded distributive lattices with box and diamond and some equational axioms. We have a representation th uh, theorem for positive model algebras that builds on Priestley duality. Um, Priestley duality is a dual equivalence between bounded distributive lattices and Priestley spaces, which are certain stone spaces with a partial order. And um, similarly to the non-positive setting, positive model algebras are dual to co-algebras for uh, an appropriate version of the Vietoris functor on Priestley spaces. Okay. And just like we, uh, stone spaces can be generalized to compact Hauser spaces, Priestley spaces admit a natural generalization to what is called, what are called compact ordered spaces that are a compact Hauser space with a partial order on it. And the, the partial order is closed in, uh, in the product topology. <clears throat> and again, here we have a, an analogous of the Vietoris functor. 
and uh, and also again here the opposite of the category of coalgebras for this functor is monadic over set so um, it could also be presented at certain certain algebras for uh, for an equational theory and for this result we use uh, an, an analogous of Duskin's result, namely that the category of compact ordered spaces is, uh, is monadic over set. Okay. Uh, so to sum up, we have these various Vitoris constructions, various version of it, and the um, and we show that the, the opposites of the categories co-algebras for for these versions are all monadic over a set. And we use categorical techniques to prove this instead of equational ones so that we didn't commit to specific signatures and equations. But yeah, it, it would be also interesting to, to see what are certain natural, certain natural uh, axiomatizations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marco, for your very interesting talk. And uh, so, are there any, any questions, comments? Yes, I will uh, bring uh, the, the mic because we record your question. It's a long shot, but uh, do you know whether, in the case, the, 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 monad, the monad comes from an opera, so that the structure is quite simple? Uh, this is some kind of instance of a causalness of kind of causal duality. Can you repeat? Uh, I didn't, I missed the first if part. If this duality is somehow related to the causal duality that you have for operats, uh, algebra over operats, uh, co-algebra. Um, okay, I don't know. Thank you for, for this. Um, okay, I will write. Okay, can you, can you tell me later? Yeah, yeah of course, about this? Of course no problem. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, other questions or comments? I have one, maybe a question or a comment, I don't know, you decide. Okay. Um, the fact that you use these such general methods to, to, to achieve your result make, you think, make me think that maybe um, there is a general theory behind that connects monodicity and, uh, um, <coughs> and duality. Did you think about this? Have you in mind any broad generalization of this? No, I, I don't know. Um... I don't know. Okay. Uh, but if I you don't know, know either, okay. but maybe we can discuss. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Maybe it's a uh, direction. Okay. Thank you. No, no, no. I mean, in, in, in a general. Yes. Okay. Uh, other question? Uh, anyone? No? So let's thank Marco again. And. Uh, I I think we are more than in time, so we can uh, we, we can resume uh, in five minutes, right? Maybe we can, uh, otherwise we, we are no longer in time then. Uh, so. As you guys can see on, uh, on the, the big screen, so I don't even need my glasses to introduce our next speaker, which is Federico Campanini. And we uh, talk about uh, some recent results on pretorsion theories in extensive categories. The stage is yours. Thank you, Beppe, for the introduction. Uh, can you hold hear me? Or is it okay? And okay, so uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity of being here. 
Uh, the plan of this talk is actually to promote the notion of pre-Dorsian theory. And uh, the main line of the talk would be to first record something about Dorsian theories, and then see how to generalize this notion into the notion of pre theory. And then we uh, see some examples in the context of extensive categories. And then uh, go back and try to associate to every pre theory a uh, Dorsian theory, possibly in a universal way. And well, this is, of course, it's not an injunction. So uh, let me start with the definition of torsion theory, which is uh, well known. It was given by Dixon in 16. Uh, if we start from an abelian category, uh, OK, we have a pair of full uh, Rilbitza category, T and F. Uh, this form of torsion theory, if there are no morphisms between something in T and some from something in T to something in F. And for every uh, object in C, there is a short exact sequence like this with the first term in T and the last term in F. And of course, the terminology comes from the, um, the well-known examples in uh, abelian groups where we have torsion groups as torsion part and torsion free groups as torsion free parts. And uh, OK, but actually, the, this condition of being for the category of being um, abelian is, uh, is not necessary. We can just repeat the same definition in any pointed category. The only thing we need is to have the zero object. And in fact, there are several uh, examples in uh, out of the billion case. We, here we have two. The first one is in the category of uh, commutative rings, where we have the impotence rings as a torsion part and the reduced rings as a torsion free part. Here we have this short exact sequence for uh, every ring. We have the impotent ideal, which is a sub ring, and uh, here the quotient. And the second one is in the category of um, topological groups where we have the groups within discrete topology as torsion part and the house of group as torsion free part. Okay, but what if we try to uh, do something in any category? So we want to remove the, the hypothesis to have a zero object. And well, of course we have problems in, in both these conditions, right? Because we have problems here and also in the definition of a, of a kind of short attack sequence. And so the first thing we want to do is to, okay, we start with N and with two subcategories, T and F, and we can uh, allow a possible intersection with what we call Z, which will form the class of trivial objects. And we say that a morphism is trivial if it factors through something in Z. So if this F is trivial, if it factors through something that is in the, in the intersection of T and F. And the class of trivial morphisms is actually an ideal of morphisms in, in C, we denote it by three, where ideal means that if we have a composition when one of the two is in the ideal, then the composition is, uh, is in the ideal. And of course, if Z is just the, the zero object in case of a pointed category, we, uh, this ideal is, is actually the ideal of zero morphisms. So now we can define kernels and co-kernels with respect to an ideal of morphisms. And the definition is the same. We just replace Z everywhere with Z trivial. So key is the Z kernel of F if this, co this composition is trivial, not zero this time. And every time we have another morphism such that this composition is trivial, then there exists, there exists a unique factorization here making this diagram commute. And of course, you can do the same thing for co-kernels dually. And uh, short as a sequence is so a uh, sequence where F is the Z kernel of G and G is the Z co kernel of, uh, of F. Uh, well, for the universal property, we actually have that uh, every kernel is a monomorphism and every co kernel is an epimorphism, thanks to the uniqueness, of course. And okay, so now we have uh, here the previous definition, and here we have the new one. So a pair TF is a pre torsion theory if we replace zero with trivials everywhere, essentially. So there are no non-trivial morphisms from something in T to something in F. And for every X in C, there exists a Z sort of exact sequence like this, where the first term in T and the last term in, uh, in F. Okay, and actually we can uh, retrace many of the basic properties of uh, torsion theories, in, uh, also in this context. For instance, we have a torsion functor and a torsion free functor which are basically given by, the, by a choice of the short exact sequence. We have two adjunctions, 
with the inclusion in the right adjoint, which is the torsion functor. And the torsion free function is a, is a left adjoint of the inclusion. Uh, we have that in a, an object is in T, if and only if its torsion part is actually exists itself, the same for, for F. We also have the two of the three classes determine the third one in the sense that if we have that there are no non trivial morphisms from a given object X into any uh, object in F, then this X must be in T. And uh, similarly for, uh, for F. And well, if we have a two composite morphisms and F is the, is the kernel of G, of course, F is an isomorphism uh, if and only if G is, uh, is trivial. So very basic uh, properties, which are essentially the same of uh, the case uh, in, of the pointed case. Okay, here we have a closure property. This is closed under external quotient, while F is closed under external monomorphisms. The three classes are all closed under retracts. Uh, the initial object is in T, the terminal object is in F, if they exist, of course. And in particular, if C is pointed, the zero object must be in, uh, in Z. And here we have a well, long stuff to say just that T is closed under subobjects, so T is hereditary. If and only if uh, for any given subobject X of Y, the torsion part of X is just given by the intersection of X with the torsion part of Y. And well, so these are were very basic uh, properties. There were many more, but I want just to skip to examples. All these examples will be of extensive categories, but I will define extensive categories later because I interested in give you some examples of pre torsion theory, not of extensive categories. So uh, the first one is in the category of pre order set. So objects are just pre orders, which are reflexive, reflexive and trusted relations. Morphisms are just modern maps. And the pre torsion theory here is given by uh, as torsion part, we have uh, equivalence relations, as torsion free parts, partial orders. So symmetric and asymmetric relations, if we intersect them, we get just the equalities. So the trivial objects are the uh, equality relations. And a short exact sequence for any given uh, pre-order is just uh, here we take as a subobject uh, the, the equivalence relation given by A is, is related to B, if only if A row B and B row A. And we, here we perform the quotient and we define this as the anti-symmetric pre-order. And there is a topological counterpart of this, this example because indeed the, the category of pre-order set is isomorphic to the category of uh, Alexander of discrete um, topological spaces, where Alexander of discrete means that we can intersect all uh, arbitrary family of opens and uh, getting opens again. And so the corresponding pre-torsion theory here is given by uh, well, the torsion part of the partition spaces. So there are uh, Spaces for which this is, there exists a partition, which is a basis for the, for the space, and the torsion free part, the T0 spaces. And well, we can generalize this example in basically two ways. We can think about a pre order like a category with just one, with at most one morphism between two objects. And so we have a generalization here in the category cut of both categories. We have here symmetric categories, which are those categories for which if there exists at least one morphism from X to Y, then there also exists a morphism in the other direction. And anti-symmetric categories, which are those for which if uh, there are morphism from X to Y and from Y to X, then the two objects must be equal. And of course, if we, if we consider intersection, we get just classes of monoids. So we have no morphism between uh, different objects. Or we can, this is another generalization, in another direction, we can consider pre-orders internally to the category. So we can consider uh, the category of pre-orders internal to a given category. We require the category to be exact in order to have the pre-torsion theory like this. But actually, since I said that um, all example will, uh, will have been of extensive category, we actually have to require that this is a pre-topos in order to get that this is a extensive category. But anyway, not important. Um, exactness is enough to have a pre torsion theory like this. And there is another pre torsion theory in CAT, which is given by uh, this one. So for the torsion part, we have the group points. And for torsion free part, the scleral categories. 
And if we intersect the two, of course, we get the, the category of them, which are just classes of groups. We have a short exact sequence of this form. So for every category, we take just the isomorphism of the category. And then the tricky part for that pre-torsion theory is to define the, the torsion-free part. What is this, the equalizer of, of this thing, which is just a, a copy of the terminal category for every isomorphism in, chi, in C. And we basically identify objects which are isomorphic at level of objects. But, well, at level of morphisms, uh, I think I can do a more picture. Um, we have, a, when I think about a quotient, I am used to think about something which is smaller in some sense because I'm identifying uh, some stuffs which will become uh, equal in the, in the quotient. So I will have mm, less stuffs in the, in the quotient. But actually this Q is bigger than C in some sense because if you have uh, something like X, Y, uh, Z, and W, F, and G, but F and G are not composable in C, but Y is isomorphic to Z, then these two objects will be equal in Q, and so I have to uh, allow this composition, and so I will have a lot of more uh, morphisms in Q. So less objects, but more morphisms. And okay, and now we arrive to the definition of extensive category. A category is extensive if it has uh, all finite limits, finite sums or products, which behaves well in terms of pullbacks in the following sense. If we have a diagram like this, where the bottom row is a sum, then the two squares are pullbacks if and only if this is the sum of A and B. Well, as I'm talking about intensive category, I said, the topology of space, the category of uh, fine schemes, cut, any pre-topos or topos is an extensive category. And if C is extensive, then also the internal pre-orders and internal categories are extensive as well. Uh, well, it's just basic properties of the extensive category. The initial object is strict, uh, finite product distributed over sums or LS is joint sums, meaning that the co-projections into the co-product are actually more and the intersection of the two is, a, is an initial object. And in particular, this diagram is both a pullback and a pushout. And this last property allows us to define or to consider complemented subobjects in, in an extensive category. So we start with an object X, a is a uh, subobject of X. We can say that A is complemented if there exists B such that A plus B is equal to X. If this is the case, then also A intersect with B will be zero. And okay, in extensive categories, T is closed under co products, while F is closed under complemented subobjects. And here we have a condition for Z to be closed under complemented subobject, which is just that trivial morphisms are stable on their pullback along co projections. And an important property, maybe I will say it again later, is that if T is closed on the complemented subobject, then all the three classes are closed under complemented subobjects uh, and co products. So we will automatically get that all the classes are closed under what we are interested in, which is co products and complemented subobjects. And now I want to try to go back to torsion theory. So I'm wondering if there's a way to associate to a pre-torsion theory, uh, a torsion theory. So the idea of course is to, uh, is to try to define a congruence in order to identify all trivial objects into the zero object, okay? But indeed, and of course we want this, uh, this kind of, mm, uh, this congruence and this quotient to send the, um, the pre-torsion into a torsion theory, okay? But of course, there's no way to define a congruence in L in order to get something like this, because uh, since zero is strict, we have no morphisms from one to zero. And so there's no way to uh, identify these two objects, which are both in, uh, in Z. So the idea is to first enlarge a bit the category L Oh, well, here we have the, the, the definition of torsion theory functor, which is just 
uh, a way to say precisely what this last line means. Uh, well, it's just a functor from a category with a pre-torsion theory into a category with a torsion theory, so a point category with a torsion theory. And this functor has to preserve the, the data. So the torsion theory has to go into the torsion theory, torsion part to the torsion part, torsion free part to the torsion free part. And it has also to preserve the, the canonical short detail sequences. Uh, okay, so here we are uh, enlarging a bit the, the category L, just at the level of morphisms. We consider partial morphisms, which are uh, uh, roofs, I would say. So here we have a subobject, um, a morphism from X to Y is uh, this thing, so it's a subobject, uh, a complemented subobject of X, and a morphism from, so a partial morphism from a, a part of X, so from A to Y. And of course, we can compose to such morphisms. Uh, we have alpha F and beta G. We can compose just performing the pullback here, which is, uh, of course, well defined. And there is an inclusion functor of L into the partial morphisms, which is the identity at the level of objects. We are not adding any object at all. But we, and at level of morphism, we just send F into the uh, identity and F. Now the category, this category is pointed, but the Z object is given by the initial object in L. And here we have the, the unique morphism from any object X into zero, and here the unique morphism from zero into X. Uh, these are unique because of the, because of the zero is P, actually. And so now here we can define a congruence in the partial orders. Uh, okay. We say that two morphisms alpha one, F one, and alpha two, F two are um, congruent if there exists such a, a diagram where C is a subobject both of A one and A two, and F one and F two agree on C. So this condition here. We also require that C is complemented, in particular that C one is uh, the complement of A one, uh, sorry, C one C is the complement of C in A one, and C two C is the complement of uh, C in A2. And we also require that on the complement, the morphism are trivial. So F1 restricted to C1 is trivial, and F2 restricted to C2C to C is trivial. Um, so basically, we require that two morphisms agree where they are all defined and they are trivial where they are not defined together. And so we have an inclusion to L into the partial morphisms. We have a congress, so we go into uh, the, the stable category, which is the, this category here. And now we have our construction and our functor. We, yes, we have several results which are similar in the conclusions, but kind of different in the, in the hypothesis. This is my favorite one, uh, which, is with, which is if we start from a pretortion theory in an extensive category, and we assume that T is closed on the complemented subobject. As we have said before, uh, this means that all the three classes are closed by complemented subobject and coproducts. So, well, the simple category is well defined. Uh, and we have what we want at the level of trivial objects and trivial morphisms. So, they are precisely the objects and the morphisms that are sent to the zero object and morphisms. And this functor preserves finite coproducts. It sends uh, Z kernels into kernels and shorted Z exact sequence into uh, genuine exact sequences. And the part for co-kernels is a bit more tricky and we have to require that all co-kernels exist in order to have the sigma sends Z co-kernels into kernels. But uh, the part of short exact sequence is enough to have a, a torsion theory functor, actually. Well, of course, another important thing is that the TNF is also a torsion theory sum, which is not trivial. And, and also, we have this uh, universal property, which is that if we have a, a e is a Howard sigma, if we have any other G, which is a torsion functor, so X is a pointed category with a given torsion theory. 
uh, if G is another torsion functor which preserves finite coproducts, then there exists a unique factorization of G uh, into sigma. And well, that's it. Thank you for uh, your interesting talk. And, uh, and now it's time for questions and uh, or remarks or uh, comments. Anyone? Uh, hi. Uh, I had a question about Z kernels and co kernels. Yes. Do they arise as like? actual limits and co-limits that you know of or and oh, that's not the case at least for a general pretorsion theory i think that's not the case in mm -hmm. general yes uh, i think it depends on the pro on property of z i guess so. other questions If not, I have one thing to ask. Okay. Uh, in the case of pre-torsion theory, so before getting to torsion theories, uh, is there any uh, studied the structure of the, the category of the two category of the pre-torsion theories, like a monoidal structure or something that you um, are aware of? Not yet. No, there's nothing uh -huh. in the direction. Yeah. Thank you. I think there is a possibility for this. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for the comment. Discuss. Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, other other questions? Okay, so let's see, take the speaker again. Yeah. Grazie Federico. And uh, we have a uh, five minutes break. Meanwhile, Fosco is uh, is uh, getting his mic. Uh, I have to apologize because I forgot to give all the affiliation of the people, and uh, I, I, I feel like in a family, so I don't I don't present it when it's my family. This is my, my father, which is living like this. So my family, and uh, uh, but uh, it's uh, correct to do it. So uh, uh, so I guess uh, that Federico. Uh, is uh, from the University of Salerno. Oh, so, sorry, Marco is from the University of Salerno, and I was uh, doing the bad thing, of course. And, uh, uh, and Federico from uh, the University of uh, Louvain-la-Neuve. Where is Federico? There. And uh, Fosco is from uh, Tallinn, which is called the University of Tallinn, or? Okay. Okay, Tallinn University. And I am from the University of Palermo, so I forgot to say. So everybody now is uh, with this affiliation, and uh, this uh, uh, gave the, the time to Fosco to 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 to, <laughs> to fix uh, to fix a technical problem. Problem uh, is it working. So there is a, a switch, I guess, uh, which is on on the red. And now should be green. Yes. This now. way better. Yeah. Good. So Fosco de Rejan, we talk about. Uh, uh, we, uh, few remarks on the vibrations of algebras. So please, first. Yes, thank you. So, uh, first thing first, this is a joint work, a work in progress, and hopefully joint work with uh, Greta Coraglia and Davide Castelnovo. They are here in the audience. Uh, actually, I have to say that this talk is stress even more that this is a work in progress. Actually, my talk is a question for the audience. Uh, our talk is uh, our work is a question for the audience because essentially we need help to finish this soon to be or hopefully paper um, that contains good ideas in my opinion but doesn't have a punchline. 
So the talk will end without a punchline. Sorry, apologies in advance. So let me start with the motivation, why we started um, asking some questions. And actually, there is a very simple example that uh, motivated us. If you, if you start studying vibrations and categorical logic or in other parts of category theory, you very soon meet this construction that is called the simple vibration. If you fix a Cartesian category, you can build a category over it that uh, has a, a typical fiber over an object, a category that has the same object of the base, and uh, a map, a morphism in the fiber between X and Y over an object I is just a morphism between X times I and Y. Composition inside the fiber is this complicated to parse expression that uh, defines this category that is called uh, uh, which fiber is called the simple slice over I. But, uh, you know, category theory is about having conceptual looks on things, so it's good to know that uh, uh, this category, this fibered category over C arises from a universal construction because every functor that, uh, every end of functor of C of a Cartesian category that sends A into A of X in X times I is a comonad because the category is Cartesian and uh, the simple slice, C slice slice I, is the Cochleisley category of this comonad. So, and composition that before was quite mysterious to parse is just Cochleisley composition. So good to know because this vibration has arises from a certain universal construction as a fairly simple universal property. Well, if now if you start playing the same game with the same component, but instead of taking the Cochleisley, you take the whole category of coalgebras, then you get the slice. So it's even better because now we have a universal meaning for um, uh, an even more straightforward category, the, the domain vibration of a Cartesian category. So when we started thinking about how to generalize, how to encompass this in a general theory, we had essentially three questions. Can we uh, write down a theory of this kind of constructions? Can we uh, lay down a foundation for the categories that arise from these and similar constructions. Can we find more examples? And in a posteriori, the answer is yes, we can say something. And there are many examples of these things arising from type theory, categorical logic, algebraic geometry, or multiple theory, pure category theory, really, you name it. And maybe even more important for applications and for finishing the damn paper is the simple vibration as a, a fairly straightforward but nice type theoretic interpretation. Can we find a, a similar type theoretic meaning for vibrations that arise from parametric endofunctors? Because this is what we are out and about. So this leads to the definition of what is the vibration of algebras and vibrations of algebras more in general. We want to study and classify vibrations that arise from a parametric functor a parametric endofunctor. I will never bother um, separating notationally a functor from a, a category A of parameters into endofunctors of X and uh, the, the mate of that. I will call them the same name. And uh, for each F of I, I is an object of the category of parameters, we consider the categories of algebra. We stitch all these categories together, as is customary in vibration theory, well, we get a contravariant functor from A to the category of categories. This induces a vibration, and this is what we want to study. We want to find examples and theorems that are valid for this kind of functors. So a starting point is to recognize that each vibration that arises in this way is the pullback of a universal vibration of algebras. This functor is uh, from uh, over the category of end of functors of X and has domain, uh, ca a category alge that essentially has over, over an end of functor, there is the whole category of algebras for that end of functor. Algebra now has to be intended very broadly because uh, I can consider end of functor algebras or co algebras. I can consider uh, Eilenberg Moore categories of monads or co Eilenberg Moore of co monads. 
Clisely or co-Clisely. So I want stuff that I can functorially attach to an endofunctor of any kind. And uh, a first remark is that every property of you, this universal vibration that uh, is, well, every property that you has and which is pullback stable is inherited by all P of F vibrations that we want to study. So this was a good starting point. There are properties of this U that are, can be bookkeeped and uh, so are inherited by every P of F. And we were fairly happy. Now, let me make precise what I mean by algebras, because I say that the term is very broadly intended. You, you have a U where the fiber over F is the category of endofunctor algebras, where F is a mere endofunctor. But if F is pointed, you might want to have uh, as fiber the category of pointed endofunctor algebras, where the, the structure is compatible with the unit, with the pointing. And if each F of I is a monad, well, it's fairly natural to ask that uh, you have as fiber the Eilenberg Moore category. Of course, you can dualize. You can do the same thing dualized, co-pointed, co, co Eilenberg Moore. Just be careful that the morphism change because you have to require more and more as you filter out the algebras that you want. So uh, if P appears in a pullback for any of the previous choices, we call them uh, a we call it a vibration of endofunctor algebras, a pointed algebra vibration, or an Eilenberg Moore vibration. And of course, again, you can dualize. You can talk about co-algebras, endofunctor co-algebras, co-pointed co-algebras, co, 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 co Moore. Just be careful that the case of Cleisley and co-Cleisley has to be treated with a little bit of um, attention. Because on the surface, one would like to say that um, you have a, a map of vibrations between Cleisley of T and Eilenberg Moore of T arising from the. But the, the problem is that these maps do not assemble in any meaningful way into a, a map of vibration, or let alone a natural transformation. Because Cleisley is uh, covariant and Eilenberg Moore is contravariant. Now, you, should, you could and should say that this is a denatural transformation, but then uh, why bother? In the end, uh, it doesn't seem that this map has any very interesting property. It's not, if I remember well, it's not even fiber at the end of fact. So the case of Cleisley categories, uh, well, I mean, you have to treat it as a per se case. What is more important is that we have plenty of examples now. Certainly we recover the example we started with. The Cochleisley vibration of this very simple commonad gives you the simple vibration. The domain vibration is the category of Co-Eilenberg, uh, is the co eilenberg moore vibration of the same commonad. But, uh, well, a first new example that is not really new because this category is a very old friend of geometers and algebraic topologists, when we, we Consider the same end of functor, but now the parameter is a monoid. Uh, this end of functor product with A is a monad. It's a fairly simple example of a monad. And the algebras now uh, for this monad, the, the Allenberg Moore category, is the category of objects with an action of the monoid. So we, we recover from starting with a fairly logic oriented uh, motivation with a quite abstract uh, motivation something that is well known in algebraic geometry because this vibration of algebras uh, of where the fibers are um, are uh, modules over a ring is very well known and very well studied also in computer science uh, other people took this idea so we recover it we can play the same game with topologies if you want because if we fix a set and it's both set of topologies then there is a fairly tautological correspondence that sends a topology into the category of sheaves for that, uh, uh, for that, uh, um, over, oh, over that topology. And this is a vibration of our kind, essentially because, uh, well, sheaves is reflective into pre-sheaves and this is a idempotent model. So we can consider these uh, reflective subcategories as the categories of algebras for idempotent monads coming from sheafification, 
where the parameter is uh, an element in the poset of topologies over a set. This looks an overly complicated way to state something simple, but you can play the same game with Grothendieck topology. And uh, even more important, you can play a similar game or you can put in, this, in a similar framework uh, an old idea of Kelly and Lovier that uh, if you fix a, a, a topos E, then the, the, the class of all its essential localizations is a, uh, possesses some structure. It's a complete lattice. And then if I play a similar game with what Lovier and Kelly call levels of the topos, I can obtain a, a category fibered over these complete lattice, which is the lattice of levels of the topos. So you see these examples have a topological instead of a type theoretic or algebraic, uh, algebraic. I can consider also polynomial functors because the way polynomial functors are built often, very often depends on a parameter. We can describe classical polynomial and the functors in the way Moedek and Palmgren described in the, their, their joint paper uh, on polynomial functors. In this fairly simple way, if you fix a locally Cartesian clause pretopos, that's enough. And uh, an object of the slice over an object over over A in the top in the pretopos, there is a polynomial and a functor that is built from uh, uh, the the functor from E, the, the section of the domain vibration, the domain vibration, and in the middle you put homing with uh, with F for the internal home in the in the locally Cartesian closed. Topos. We can study more modern uh, versions, more modern flavors of polynomial functors because Gambino and Koch devised this notion, this very elegant, very general notion of polynomial functor that depends not on a morphism of the slice, but on this diagram. It's not a span, it's not a cuspan, it's this shape, and uh, that book keeps how the coefficients of the polynomial depend on uh, i, b, and a. And, uh, well, each such fractor f is the object of a category. And my category of parameters now is uh, uh, this one. And the, the, the end of factor that I obtain is over the slice on i. So it's a very layered construction, you see. But it's an example of something quite simple that we are able to, to fit in a hopefully bigger framework. So there is hope that this is, this is saying something, although we don't really know exactly what. We can also make a few structural observations about this. And then, unfortunately, the talk will finish. I say there will be no punchline. Uh, but we can try to have a more structural view on this. Well, for example, we can refine with a little bit of knowledge on presentable categories and transfinite constructions. We can say that, well, if the end of functors are, have some rank, if I can bound their accessibility rank, uh, the reindexing of the vibration of algebras are uh, all uh, um, right adjoints. They have a left adjoint. You can build with the adjoint functor theorem done fiber wise, uh, you can build a left adjoint for each reindexing. And uh, well, there is little to add about this. Of course, this is not our idea. The proof is very simple. And it's based on the usual strategy Freud uh, uses to use the adjoint factor theorem. Uh, the only thing I could say is that this happens a lot, actually, because it happens quite often that the functor that you consider have some access, they, they have bounded, uh, bounded rank. A notable example is, uh, from algebraic theories, many algebraic theories, many polynomial functors that have a finite, that are finitary. Uh, this is a two-dimensional view on what we did, what we say, what we did, because there is a very um, two categorical way to characterize the vibrations we want. Vibration is uh, an allenberg moore vibration, so every fiber is the allenberg moore category of a parametric monad, if and only if, in the two category of vibrations, there is a morphism of vibrations from P to the projection, which is a monadic oneself in uh, vibrations over A, which is kind of elegant. If you unwind this criterion, it's essentially saying that uh, 
uh, H has a left joint, which is fibred over, well, that should be, yes, A. And then uh, the, the, the Allenbermore object for the monad that you have from the adjunction L and H is exactly B. So a fairly elegant. This sort of suggests that there is something too categorical formal going on here. And the proof is not particularly exciting. So, well, uh, there is another way to um, characterize this, uh, to, to state this two-dimensional criterion. I don't know if I'm going slightly over time, but uh, this is, uh, well, this exploits, this says the very same thing, but exploits the fact that instead of presenting the Allenberg move vibration in the way I said before, this is saying that uh, a vibration is of this kind, if and only if uh, from that we can extract a diagram of uh, monadic categories indexed over the category of parameters. Because essentially, this category of, uh, uh, of uh, monadic functors over x is equivalent, anti equivalent to um, the category of, uh, of uh, monads on x. Good. So, another kind of juicy example that we can uh, fit in our framework is that of graded monads. Graded monads are a notable example of a functor that in some sense is depending on a parameter, although in a not exactly a, uh, not exactly the same sense we, we are talking about. They are vastly used, vastly studied in computer science. And uh, well, the starting idea is an old uh, motto of Benabu. A monad in cat is just a lax functor from the point to cat, because the condition for t to be a lax functor are exactly the monad axioms. A graded monad, instead, is a lax functor from something else, something bigger. In particular, the case that is studied in computer science and elsewhere is a lax functor from um, the, the looping of a monoidal category. You regard them as a one object by category, and then a lax functor from uh, this by category into cat uh, will be a graded monad by definition. And you can do to a fairly large extent the formal theory of monads for graded monads in this sense. So, and, and these are in a very strong sense and the functors depending on a parameter. You, you, for example, you can say that um, the object of algebras for a graded monad is exactly the lax limit of the lax functor associated. And of course, this is true also for a uh, lax functor from the point. There, this is the universal property of the island Bermuda category. So can we do something similar? Well, in a sense, yes. In a sense, this, our story is even more general because we are doing something similar, but we are not requiring monoidality in the domain, in the uh, category of parameters. And uh, every... A plain category will do. Every category of parameters does our job. And there is a, a stark difference in the way, in how we consider algebras, because for us, the, the, starting, the starting point was considering all categories of algebras separately. Instead, for graded monads, you consider algebras that have an action of every T of i, where i is the parameter. You fix an object that, that possesses an action of every T of I, compatibly. So how to solve this conundrum? How do these definitions interact? Well, uh, the, 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 the point is that there is a by category, sigma of A, that you can lift, uh, you can regard the category of parameters as a uh, lifted up version of a by category in such a way that, uh, for example, for Allen-Bohmer algebras, Functors from the parameters to monads and monads morphisms are exactly lax functors. Oops, are exactly lax functors from sigma of a to cat. And the diagram that you we have, the diagram of algebra, is exactly a presentation for what the lax limit of uh, uh, this correspondent f tilde from sigma a to cat is. So graded monads say we have a parametric end of functor. And we have a diagram uh, that presents its lax limit. We throw away the diagram and we keep the lax limit. We have both because we have the diagram. And if we want, we can compute the lax limits. So again, this is saying uh, there is something under this hood uh, 
but uh, now you wonder what is going to happen in the next slide and we don't know because we worked about this you see we have something but uh, in in our opinion there is not very much to tell a coherent story to write a paper about this to uh, really point out some application some theorem that we can prove and other people can't so you see this is a cry for help because anyone that has suggestions or can find a better narrative can provide more intuition about what we are doing uh, is more than welcome to help us we have a language but we don't know where to use it so it's uh really we are desperate <laughs> and <laughs> greta is nodding because yeah we are <laughs> so but anyway thank you this for his talk and uh, let's help him and uh, help uh, his whole but also that and David <laughs> to, I'm not to alone in this mess help the co-authors and, uh, and Fosco to to so to write this paper so any comment uh, is uh, very welcome I think here is uh, the rescue thank you uh very, very, very basic question. Mm. What is that sigma that's supposed to be the left adjoint in the last ejection? Uh, yeah, it's... Um, is it like B or is it the... No, it be, because it's not exactly the, the looping of a category into a by category. It's... Uh, I have to check in the notes because this this was done two weeks ago. I'm, I'm really in the messy stage of understanding. So it's not there the is, same. This, this by category is two objects. And then, uh, uh, oh, yeah, and A is the category of morphisms. Between yes, A okay. is the category of parameters. And from A, <laughs> you build this by category with two objects. And then, uh, honestly, I don't remember, but. Uh, yes, Great. exactly. Please. Yes, so if I remember correctly, basically, you just have a source object and a target object, and you map. Um, objects to maps and then uh one cells to two cells between these and kind of uh two ways de looping kind of way yeah huh? it's a bit tricky yes but does it does this have a name people more comfortable with probably yeah it looks like someone see why i called it sigma two points of suspension say so what you say about this two points it's used, for instance, in some works of uh, Martina Rovelli and Victoria Zornova, uh -huh. where they use it to get some property of orientals. Okay. And uh, I think they call it two-point suspension from topology. But then I was right to call it sigma. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy. <laughs> I think they call it sigma too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay so Completely unbeknownst. So okay, at least I'm we happy. helped for the name of the thing. Yes. The, uh -huh. the rovelli Zornova construction. Uh, yes. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> so, uh, are there any other questions or comments or other? Ah, it's me again. Um, so, you're commenting here about the, like, it's more general than just an action, right? There's no monodality assumption. Yes. But if you have that, can you say something more? Have you thought about this? Well, if you, if your A is uh, a monoidal category, but and if, then you if also a hunter. Yeah. exactly ex that that's that's the point. Uh, the um, graded monads essentially say, look, I have a family of endophantos like this, but then I have uh, the multiplication is not uh, TM composed TM into TM, but it's TX composed TY into T of XY whatever xy means and in a monoidal category that's the tensor so you have a lax monoidal functor we we don't ask it we we don't require it but if you do you recover exactly graded monads. yeah yeah no I, i'm familiar with that no my question is so you have this nice like you can look at these vibrations of algebras and this very nice I mean, yes. like if you add this extra thing uh -huh. you get extra nice things 
Like for example, like I think the vibration gets monoidal, then probably you pull back a monoidal vibration. The the problem is how algebras are treated because uh, the notion of algebra for a graded monad is not the algebras for t t x and x stays fixed. The same the same a as an action for every for every m in the monoidal category in the parameters and the algebra axioms are quantified over all at the m's which is something that we don't have i see okay the the problem is exactly a graded monad is uh, defines a notion of algebra that is the lax limit of the lax functor we don't we present a diagram with which we can compute the lax limit. And then we obtain the same thing. Okay, thank That's you. That's the, the gap. Thank you, Matteo. <clears throat> I think that uh, well, we, are, we are still in time, so I mean, luckily for, for the coffee break, otherwise. Luckily, yeah. so, uh, are there the any club. other questions or comment? If, uh, if, if not, let's thank Fosco again. And uh, in uh, five minutes, uh, there will be the coffee break, which uh, will be, in, uh, okay, we will show, we will fo follow the, the smell. Uh, so, uh, I think we should resume. Uh, so, welcome back to the second session of uh, this third Itaca workshop. So, the first speaker is Andrea Gagna from the Czech Academy of Sciences, and he will talk about uh, a categorical take on Steiner Omega categories. So, please, Andrea. Well, thank you very much to the organizers for organizing this event again here in Pisa. And I'm going to talk about uh, a joint work with uh, Dimitri Ara, Victoria Zornova, and Martina Robelli. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about these Steiner Omega categories. So let me start by recalling what an Omega category actually is. So everything I will say is about strict Omega categories, no weak stuff. So a strict, yeah, simple, algebraic, nice. <laughs> it's a reflective uh, Omega graph. So a gadget like this, we have objects. Ah, come here. <laughs> right. Objects, one arrow, n minus one arrow, n arrow, all the way up. We have uh, sources, oh, it's more complicated than spec. Sources, <laughs> targets, and uh, identities. And uh, some axioms like uh, the target of the target is the target of the source. Think about the two cell and uh, some access about the identity, etc. Okay, this is the data plus another piece of data that are the composition, of course, because we have categories. Composition for any dimension uh, bigger than uh, bigger or equal than zero. Uh, this is the, the dimension uh, with which you glue these these pieces together and several actions of uh, associativity, identity, exchange, etc. There are several ways to say this. You can also uh, <clears throat> define omega categories by enrichment, and they, they are, of course, equivalent. So example to keep in mind are the usual drawings of uh, objects, uh, one, uh, one arrow, two arrows, three arrows, and glue in, and modern, in all the possible way you can imagine. OK. <clears throat> Let me give you some examples and some notable examples. So probably the most important examples are the disks. And the disk co-represents arrows. So if you take uh, omega functors from D0 to an omega category, these are precisely the objects. With D1, you have uh, the one arrow. With the two, the two arrows, et cetera. And if you want to think about omega categories a bit geometrically, you want to have disks and spheres. So you can perform the usual, user structures that. Uh, you, 
you can perform in topology. And uh, spot the differences is just a kind of the boundary of the disks, right? Uh, the minus one sphere is nothing, is the initial omega cathode is empty. S0 is the boundary of the one arrow. S1 is the boundary of the, uh, the two cell and uh, et cetera, okay? The problem with disks and spheres is that they are graph theoretic. They don't encode compositions. So in order to encode composition, you need some other shapes. Uh, one shape that was introduced by uh, Ross Street are orientals. And if you look at them, they kind of encode some kind of directed associativity, right? So we have the point, the arrow, the composition, but directed by a two cell. And the third oriental, O3, is just an associativity, but with directions. Can be oplax or laps, whatever you choose. Another way devised by Joyal and others are theta objects. So theta objects are nice gadgets that encode some basic composition of omega categories. So let me try it maybe like this. Yeah. So you have some basic composition like this. Yeah, this is too hard. <laughs> and at each stage, you have some composition uh, in the vertical way that can be of different kinds. So it can be two cells, three cells, et cetera. But what you cannot have, oops, sorry. What you cannot have is composition that go along, that skip one object or more, right? Everything is contained in uh, between two uh, neighbor objects. And they can have all the possible shapes you can imagine. And uh, the, <clears throat> these, two these two examples are rich, very rich in structure. And the morphisms between these objects are very complex. Uh, so Street devised the, the notion of a computed uh, to deal a bit with uh, his orientals. There is a notion of a reef product to talk about the morphisms of Joyal Tita uh, subcategory of omega categories. But still, the, the morphisms are hard to describe. These infinity functions between these objects are complicated and very rich. Uh, these objects are all free in a very precise way. So uh, I will use the French terminology. So what uh, street called computers, French people call polygraph. And the polygraph, so omega graph was already taken, so we need another. <laughs> Graphs are two categories. Uh, what polygraphs are for omega categories. So from a graph, you can freely build the category. And the same kind of gadget were for omega categories. Uh, just as more topological. So it's, in a way, it's a bit easier. I won't tell you exactly what the polygraph is, but I will tell you what the omega category freely generated by the polygraph is. So those are exactly the cellular objects, if you want in omega category, if you want to be topological. What does it mean? You, you have a omega category C, <clears throat> you have a set of arrows of any dimension you want. This set must contain all objects. The objects are a subset of this. And then essentially at each level, you have to generate freely C by the object of E of that dimension. And if you look at this, this is just a, how you generate a CW complex, right? You have a bunch of, uh, yeah, let me try a bunch of n cells. This is the n truncation of C. So you just forget about all the cell of higher dimension than n. Uh, you know how to glue them in a way, how to, what are the sources and the targets in the n minus one truncation. You add them freely, it just means that this square is a push out. So you, you are given some N minus one cells parallel, N minus one cells that are source and targets. And you add an X cell freely as a pushout. So at each level, you have some kind of universal property of the pushout. That's the idea. Uh, in order to deal with this complex notion of free objects and uh, morphism between orientals and theta, et cetera, uh, Richard Steiner devised a nice theory which uh, is kind of uh, homological in a way. And uh, it's it works surprisingly well. 
His idea was to define these augmenting directed complexes. And I will show you how these are linked to omega categories and why they are very important. So an augmented directed complex, ADC, is just an augmented complex of uh, abelian groups. So a complex in non-negative degrees with an augmentation and all the differential. And uh, what is this directed? At each level, you have a submonoid Kn plus of the abelian group Kn. And these are called the positivity submonoid. So uh, Steiner's idea is to look at these objects as a kind of some homological trace of uh, an omega category. But uh, given like this, it doesn't make really sense. Uh, what we want is to, yes, of course. Just a question. These submonoids are uh, in relation with the differential somewhere, somehow? Good point. OK. <laughs> <laughs> it's not prepared, I swear. <laughs> yes? Um, can we think of the positivity submonoids as being the marking of some associated uh, um, uh, completion set? Uh, it, it's, it's similar in a way. So now we'll tell you exactly what this positivity means for this homological trace of an omega category. Essentially, we want to think each uh, abelian group of each item mentioned as free, essentially freely generated by some classes of cells. And uh, just a Z, the integers have two generators, minus one and one. And we want to fix one. So this gives you the uh, class of a cell that generates uh, an omega category Z polygraph, essentially. So you're fixing the source and the target somehow. The exactly. The differential tells you exactly the source and the target, yes. Exactly. So this is just a. Uh, a general definition to have a nice category. So it's uh, locally presentable, it's everything you want, but uh, we want uh, smaller objects with better properties. This is a big category with good properties, but the objects are not what we want. So we restrict to the objects we, that bears a more interesting uh, connection with omega categories. So we say that uh, uh, an augmented directed complex as a basis, if essentially at each degree, each Kn, Sabellian group, is free generated uh, by some elements, so it's a direct sum of uh, Zs, of the integers. But then there is the positivity, what I was saying to Eduardo. So each Kn is a free abelian group uh, on some set Bn. So think about the direct sum of uh, for each element of Bn, and then you pick a generator, essentially. So you have Z plus Z plus Z, and in each Z, you either choose one or minus one. The, essentially, all the information is here. Uh, in particular, the basis, if it exists, is unique. It's a property, because uh, you, you chose the, the, the generator for each Z, either one or minus one. And this Bn has, has to be uh, thought as a kind of a, the class of the generating cells of an omega category. And this is, will be made precise. So now I will have to tell you, I have to go in some technicalities. Just bear with me with a couple of slides. But it's, if you think of these uh, augmented directed complexes with bases as some homological trace of uh, an omega category, it makes sense. So for each element, uh, C, that you think as a, some kind of a composition of N cells, because it's a, how do you think as a composition? Well, it is a linear decomposition, right? So we have a unique decomposition. This lambda B are integers, and B are the elements appearing there. And there is the, notion, the usual notion of support. Maybe we'll go once. The support are just uh, all the B actually appearing in the decomposition. It's a, they are in finite number. It's a linear uh, decomposition. And uh, some lambda will be positive, some lambda will be negative. The Bs 
appearing with positive lambda is the positive support. The Bs that have a negative coefficient are, the, are called the negative support. All right? <clears throat> and you can write any C as its positive support minus its negative support. I'm not saying any, anything intel, intelligent here. I'm just saying uh, <laughs> you have a free abelian group, any element of the free abelian group, you write it as a linear decomposition of the element of the basis. Some elements have the positive coefficient, some, element, some element has a negative coefficient. That's it. What is interesting is that uh, when you apply this to the boundary, because the boundary, if you think I see as some kind of N cell or a class of N cell, is supposed to give you the target, which is the positive part, and the source of C. In fact, if C is an element of the basis, there is even a notation for this that I will tell you a little bit more about. But what you have to remember here is that uh, you take the differential of an element, it has a linear decomposition, a positive and a negative part. Right, here's what I want to say. Uh, okay, here is a mistake. This is supposed to be an element of Bn, an element of the basis. So if you have an element of the basis, here you are essentially describing it as a kind of cell. You have a C is the N cell. Then you have a, the source of C and the target of C. And then you can uh, take the, the the source of the source and the source of the tiger of the target. So you will have something, if you think of the N cell, something like this, you will have maybe this is the source, this composition is, uh, yes, is this, and maybe a target of this kind. This composition is this. And this will be the iterated source and the iterated target. And this is the C, which identifies as a C2 plus minus. Why all this definition? Because there is a notion of unitality that uh, we have to impose. Uh, any cell of an omega category as uh, an iterated source, which is a single object, as an iterated target that is a, a single object. With complexes, you never know. You can have a, this as a many objects. And this cannot happen if we think of these cells as cells of an omega category. So we want to impose that's, that this guy over here, as a linear decomposition, is just one term. It's an element of the basis of uh, K0. It's not a sum of points, it's just a point. Last definition, I promise. Uh, if we take an omega directed complex with basis, there is a priority relation. A uh, less or equal than B that is defined in this way. Either A is in the, you remember we have the boundary and we can take the negative and positive part. Is in the negative part. So for instance, here, this guy would be A less or equal than B. Is in the negative part of the boundary. Otherwise, if this is A, this could be B. So. B is in the positive boundary of A. And if you iterate this, uh, this gives you a priority relation. And we say that uh, this, uh, this augmented directed complex with basis is uh, Steiner if this priority relation is, ac is actually partial order, so it's anti-symmetric, and it's unital. So, you have this complex, at each level you have a, a basis. This basis has this nice property that it is loop free, so you cannot have A, B, and A again. You don't repeat the elements of the boundaries if you follow this relationship, and it is unital. So this, the iterated source and the iterated target are just a single object, not a bunch of objects. 
okay, now I come to the link. The main theory of Steiner is that there is an adjunction between omega categories and augmented directed complexes. And the right adjoint, this nu, this lambda stands for linearization, and this nu is a kind of nerve. This nu is fully faithful when restricted to Steiner complexes. Uh, so Steiner complexes are really a very faithful trace of uh, omega categories. They are completely algebraic. They are uh, chain complexes, and they encode all the complexity of omega functors. But do we have examples of this? Oh, yeah, this is for fun just to see how this thing is done. And it's really what we said, right? It's uh, at level n, you take the free abelian group generated by the cells, and the composition becomes sum. And the differential is just a target minus source. The category of Steiner complexes is very rich. It's closed under tensor product, which is the great tensor product, and under the join, so the, the join of omega categories. And it contains these spheres, orientals, and ele element of Joyal category theta. And now we have a, a question. So can we identify the omega categories that are in the essential image of this uh, functor nu uh, by Steiner complexes? So can we characterize the Steiner omega categories? Steiner itself uh, proposed the solution, and he said, use the lambda functor, use the left adjoint, the linearization. Just the definition is a bit awkward, because uh, this C is in the image of some Steiner complex, so with base, loop-free, unital. If its lambda is a basis, its lambda is loop-free, its lambda is atomic, which is a weird definition, and uh, it is a kind of unitality, but at each level, which is very complex to, to check. So with, with the, the other collaborators, we wanted to understand better this thing, and we had to understand better this thing, and give it up to properties only dependent on C. OK. First, we had to understand the, this basis, this lambda basis, lambda loop free, and how it relates with polygraphs and other notions of uh, loop freeness that you can give for omega categories uh, internally. And it behaves very badly. It's always true that if C is free as a polygraph, lambda C as a basis, but the contrary is not true. This is a very complicated example. Don't read it. It's just to say <laughs> there is an example of C, which is not a polygraph, but the lambda C as a basis. So it's free in the complex sense, but not free in the omega categorical sense. And uh, it's always true that it's C is loop free as an omega category in a strong sense, then lambda c is loop-free. But the contrary is not true. If you take this very simple example, here you see that as an omega categorical level, f is both in the source of alpha and in the target of alpha. But if you compute what happens in, what happens in the lambda, what you have is that uh, the boundary of alpha is uh, h plus f minus g minus f. So the f disappears. The class of f disappears. And uh, in fact, the positive boundary of this class of alpha is just h, because f disappeared, which is different from the support of the target of alpha, which is f composed with h. So loop-free and basis are very badly behaved in, uh, in the complexes. Ah, and this guy is also, is even, the lambda of this is even Steiner, but if you apply this new, you don't get this back. You get another omega category. So how to solve this? Well, uh, if you give a nice definition of loop freeness for omega category, which is kind of what you expect, so you have these uh, generators and you say, OK, A is smaller than B. If either A is some source of B, possibly iterated, so uh, for instance, this guy could be an iterated source of the two cell, and this guy could be an iterated target of the two cell. And if this is opposite, is a partial order, then you say that it's loop-free. Well, with this definition, you can actually show that C Steiner if and only and it is loop-free under this condition. And I stop here. So thank you, Andrea, for the very nice talk. We have time for one or two very quick questions. And very quick, two questions, mm -hmm. very quick. 
First question, uh, what if you internalize, I mean, uh, for instance, in a billion groups, so you get the can uh, dot correspondence or something uh, for... Uh, yeah, yeah I, think, I think you get the, the classical result of... Uh, uh, okay, the, the, the old can. The, yeah, exactly. Uh, between the uh, simplician complexes and... Okay. Born, maybe, I think Born proved... Uh, Born also proved yeah. for groups. Yes. For but it's the same. Cat, cat, uh, internal omega categories, internal omega group weights yeah, yeah, are, yeah. Okay. are isomorphic. Okay, true. Okay. And second, this was just to understand if I understood. Yeah. <laughs> and the question, question is, uh, did you consider um, uh, passing schemes? This is theory by, oh, by yes. Johnson. Uh, yes, yes. So th there is a nice paper, uh, I don't remember by whom, who relates uh, paste schemes, uh, computats, and Steiner theory, and uh, there is not one that contains the other, but uh, in the nice case of free loop free and uh, some nice properties, they all coincide. So you can use whatever, you, whichever theory you want. Yeah, it's it's a master thesis, I think, of somebody. No problem. One more question. Um, so, um, two super quick questions. Um, are computers uh, closed under retracts? Oh, nice question. I don't think so. So it's not like a, with simple short categories where they are the... Yeah. Okay. I think the, ex the weird example that uh, C is... Uh... Oh, maybe no. I have to think about it. I think not, but... Uh... And the second one is, um, uh, are Steiner complexes uh, dense uh, inside Omega Cat? Yeah, even, even finite Steiner complexes. That's what I thought, because they have theta, right? Exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah, that, that's how you get a great tensor product and join if you want, by... Uh, exactly, by extension, by the... So, we stop here, so thanks, Andre, again. <laughs> so, the next speaker... Uh, where is the next speaker? is Luca Mesiti from the University of Leeds. And uh, he will talk about uh, Lux conical two limits and uh, growth and deconstruction. So, Luca, the stage is yours. Okay, it's working. Where is the pointer? Okay. Thank you very much to the organizer for the opportunity to speak here and to all of you for listening. This talk is based on a paper that will appear soon. And in short, I will present the problem of conicalizing weighted limits in a rich setting and show you an essential solution in the Katernitz case, which will produce the two concepts that appear in the title in a simultaneously. So maybe this will convince you that there is quite a strong bond between the two. And at this point, we will study the Grotenic construction, actually an extended version of it, from a more abstract point of view, using the Lux normal two limits. And in particular, we will establish a pointwise scan extension result. And so let's first recall that an ordinary cone on some F 
with vertex u can be written in a fancy way as a natural transformation from the constant at u to f, or equivalently as one from the constant at one, which makes things more clear. And the problem in, in the enriched setting is that one is not sensitive enough in the sense that the morphies from one to some object don't fully capture that object anymore. For example, if you take a category, then the functors from one will only pick the objects of the category. And if you want to capture the morphisms, well, then you need to consider functors from two, maybe. And this brings to the definition of a weighted limit, where on the right below, we have this upgraded version of cones that we now call cylinders. But we do pay attention to when W is delta one. In that case, we call the limit conical. And now the question is, uh, it is true that in the set enriched case, every weighted limit is conicalizable. But the question is, under which other enrichment phases is, is this true? And there is a very important example that justifies the need of weighted limits, which is that we really want to say that every copper ship is a colimit of representables. And this can be achieved as a co-limit of the unit embedding weighted by the copper ship itself. And there is actually a nice lemma of continuity of a limit in the weight that tells us that if we are able to conicalize, essentially conicalize the special co-limits of representables above in a nice way, then we are also able to conicalize every weighted limit at that point. Because if we manage to have on the left hand side below any weighted limit with s equal to delta one, then we would find on the right a conical limit. And it's true that we have another weight, but maybe that can simplify by unit dilemma if that diagram is similar enough to the unit embedding. So let's consider the cut and reach the case. And and those special colimits of representables and try to uh, encode a, a co-cylinder phi in terms of a possibly relaxed cocoon phi tilde. And a, a strict cocoon would never make it because now in dimension two, phi will also have an assignment of morphisms. But maybe bending the rules a bit and admitting two cells inside the cocoons, we will manage to to encode everything of phi here. And as I was saying before, as we want to then apply the lemma of continuity in the weight to conclude the conicalization of every weighted limit, we search for a diagram that is the unit embedding precomposed with something that up to now is just a symbol, but we're going to determine what it needs to be. And it will be a, an extended version of the Grothendieck construction. And so for every A in A and every X in W of A, phi is giving us a morphism from unit of A to U. And we want to build a cocoon with exactly these morphisms. So we need the objects of our two categories that we are constructing to parameterize all of these. And so we can call those objects A comma X and they need to get projected down to A. And if we admit two cells inside phi tilde, maybe asking it to be at least a lax natural transformations, we can now also encode the assignment of morphisms of phi. As long as we have those uh, morphisms on the left for every A and for every alpha in W of A, a morphism that we can call identity comma alpha to keep the notation consistent with having the projection to be the projection of the first component. And now we see, however, that phi tilde cannot be too lax either because it needs to encode the strict naturality of phi somehow. And we can do so using other structure to cells, but then we need another kind of morphism in order to category for every morphism f from a to a prime and every x in w of a that we can think of as above a. And these morphisms are like liftings of F to X. And then we 
these two kinds of morphisms are the only one that we need, but we have to close them under composition. And there is a swapping property that we need to ask in order to have then the naturality of phi on morphism. But after this, we, we can say that every finite composition is reduced to one of this kind. And then we take these morphisms here to be the morphism of our two category, and they will compose by the swapping property and the natural composition of morphisms of the same kind. And then we also want to encode the two naturality of phi. So for every two cell delta and every x, we have this equality. And then we see that we need a two cell delta to the x that lands into g to the x because we want the two cell on the right square to be the identity. And then it needs to get projected down to delta as we want on the rightmost two cell unit of delta. And then the domain needs to be the right thing. And it's natural to ask again an analogous uh, swapping property. And at this point, every horizontal composition is of two cells is reduced to a whiskering identity beta delta to the x. And so we take these ones as two cells and we see that it's just a property now for a two cell delta to elevate to a two cell that lands into G beta. And we can give some names to what we have produced. We call the two category together with its projection, the two set enriched growth and deconstruction of W, tell you later why. And this is a, an extended version of the usual growth and deconstruction to allow A to be a two category, uh, but it's also a, a generalization of the construction of the category of elements as well. And then we call a lax normal natural transformation, a lax one, such that the structure to cells on every f to the x is the identity. And here we are including as a piece of structure some marking uh, that sees the domain as a growth and deconstruction there. So in some sense, we are taking a two category and giving there a way of splitting it into a vertical and horizontal part and ask the laxness to only be in the vertical part. And from this, we can build the notion of lux normal conical to limit, taking the conical weight and using lux, natural lux normal natural transformations. And from this, we immediately get also a notion for colimits, but it comes out that if we start from a weight that is from a op to cut, there is a slightly more natural construction we can do and then take op lux normal colimits. And so we find this theorem that appears in street, but now with the new proof, more intuitive. That is that lux normal conical to limits are particular weighted ones, weighted by these slices that are nice to compare to, to the ones that uh, weight the lux conical to limits without normal, but those are two dimensional slices, while well, these ones are one dimension. And then we can extend the argument of before to a complete isomorphism that shows that we can essentially conicalize every special colimit of representables, and then from that, every weighted limit. And we can see this example to understand more what's going on here. Take again the colimits of representables that build every copy shift, and then the lux normal cocoon that we get is this one that I think is showing that the growth in the construction is really born to make this thing work. And in particular, if we take A equals one, we obtain that one is lux normal conical dense in cut, in the sense that every category can be built as a lux normal conical colimit of one. And so the lux normal cocoon is given a, on the components by taking the objects of that category and on the two cells inside by taking more. So we have given another way to capture a category uh, other from considering functors from two to that category. We can just consider functors from one, but then also natural transformations between one and the category. 
And now we want to study the growth in construction from a more abstract point of view. And in dimension one, we have an analog of the square that presents the growth in con the construction of the category of elements as a comma object. But the first thing we notice is that the best we can have is a lax normal natural transformation in this square. And so we are forced to go out of the strict two cut. And in order to consider lux natural transformation as well. And we obtain a lux free category, two cut lux. That means a category enriched over the one category of two categories and lux functors. And here the interchange rule will be lux in the sense that if we have alpha and beta taking the structure to cells of beta on the components of alpha will give us a free cell between the two different evaluations of that horizontal composition. And a way to capture this is by considering what I call a two-set enrichment after a nice discussion with Francesco Danino that is here. And the idea is to start from set, enriching over it, and this gives you cut. And at that point, you want to weakly enrich over cut, because otherwise we would enrich just on the underlying category of cut, losing information. And, and so uh, we can build this definition of lux comma in any lux free category. It's in dimension one, it asks the same thing as a comma, but in dimension two, it asks just to have a, a free set between the two pastings there. And we recover a unique two cell from V to W as long as we ask other than that it gets projected to the right to thing, also that the free cell associated to the lux interchange rule of doing nu and then lambda is precisely xi from we started from, and then also a three dimensional property. And it is true that we can express in this way the two set enriched growth in construction with the lux comma, or equivalently with a pullback that uses this lux pointed version of cut. And this also offers us a way to ex canonically extend the, growth in, the two set enriched growth in construction to a two functor. And this slide is also interesting from an elementary topos point of view, because I think it's saying that this should be the canonic, the archetypal three-dimensional classification process, where on the right we have the inclusion of a verum into generalized truth values. And now the classification in dimension three is regulated by lux commas, while in dimension two by commas, and in dimension one just by pullbacks. And then what gets classified, and the answer is the split two set of vibrations with small fibers, where two set of vibrations are an extension of the usual grotenic of vibrations, where we ask on the morphemes to have discrete vibrations. Remember before that it was just a property for a two cell delta to elevate to a two cell in the grotenic construction. And then it is also true in dimension one that that square presents F as the point where it's left an extension of delta one along the, growth in, along the construction of the category of elements. We wanted to achieve something like this. And there is a theorem in Berg that I think is saying that at least a weak can extension result is true there, which is the, the first line. And then we can use that isomorphisms together with having a lux comma, which is the line in the middle, to achieve uh, the two fully faithfulness of the two set enriched growth in construction, and that we have then the two equivalents. And it's interesting to notice how it restricts down to pseudo and strict case. And in the third line, we find precisely what we have seen in the proof before of the conicalization in dimension two. And below we find that the cleavage preserving functor and the Cartesian ones have really a lot to do with lux transformations and the sigma ones that are the pseudo analog. And then I wanted to say that this kind of extension is pointwise as well, but we first needed a concept of uh, co-limit that 
wasn't, uh, there was no concept of collimity in the two certain rich case. So I thought, what is a nice notion of collimity that emerges naturally in two catalogs together with the growth in construction? And I said, well, I, maybe I could use the OPLAX normal two collimits. Now, non necessary conical anymore. And I make it more explicit, this piece of structure given by some marking to view the domain as a growth in construction. And now we can rephrase our theorem of conicalization in dimension two to say that in two catalogs, every trivially marked weighted to collimit is equivalently a marked trivially weighted to collimit. And so then I, I propose this definition of pointwise left can extension along a two set of vibration where I just took the the usual definition in the rich setting, which is just the right part, but I added there the marking that we naturally have if we are extending along a two set of vibration. And this works in the sense that I managed to prove that then F is also the pointwise left can extension of delta one along the two certain rich protein construction. And at this point, I wonder if this notion of uh, pointwise left can extension was sensible somehow. And so I wanted to say at least that every pointwise can extension is also a weak one. And this is classically based on the parametrized unit dilemma. So I needed to prove a generalization of the parametrized unit dilemma to involve these transformations into variables that are both OPLAX normal in one and LUX in the other, together with the compatibility that says that you can swap a structure to cells of different kinds. And so I proved this OPLAX normal LUX parameterized unit dilemma, where the alphas are these OPLAX normal and LUX together, and they correspond to morphisms from one that are extraordinary LUX. I think it's nice to notice that a fully lax parameterized unit lemma just couldn't work because we need some strictness in order to expand the datum of, on the identity to a complete transformation. And this shows like the minimum amount of strictness that you need. And it's that of OPLAX normal natural transformation. And at this point, it was just a corollary that every point that is left can extension into cut lax is also a weak one. And Thank you for listening. Thank you, Luca, for the nice talk. So are there any questions? So, so if not, maybe I have one. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> so what about uh, enriching on a different category with respect to set? So you have these two set enriched stuff and if you replace set by another yeah that, another that's category. a very interesting question i still don't know <laughs> but i think it would be probably the right context to consider uh, in order to have generalization of this kind of things so maybe other conicalization result of the weighted limits in in those settings so i think that cut is special because it's set cut and then we can build two set cut on it. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? So if not, let's thanks Luca again. <laughs> and we have five minutes break. Hello? I don't know, it's very weird. Yes? Sa, 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 I don't know what people say in microphones. I've never done this. <laughs> yes, okay, thanks. All right, so types and terms, fuzzy logic. So we come up with this kind of nice square. So we, when we have binary stuff and we have proposition kind of things, you have zero and one. And then when you go to types, it's the same way as you go from two to sets. So instead, when you go from binary to fuzzy, 
we can kind of work with the unit interval and then we can generalize that. But in this direction, just go, okay, from zero one to the unit interval. Then what do we put in the last square, which is the one that we are looking for? Uh, we just consider sets with a valuation with values in the zero one interval. So this will be the kind of the, the line that we follow. So from zero one to sets and from zero one to the unit interval. Okay, so first, I'm gonna tell you what structure we consider that is interesting to us in the, the unit interval. So we consider a commutative monoid uh, such that it's ordered uh, with a partial order that respects the, the monoid operation. And it's unitally bounded, meaning that the top element is also the unit of the, of the monoid. And we ask that it's complete in a sense of the category theory-like sense. So we have an exponential object or an internal on in the monoid. Um, with respect, of course, of the monoid operation. And we call that the internal home of M and N. So I'll give you some examples. So two is, a, is an example. So we've been doing something good. The unit interval is an example. So I, th I think you'll be surprised of this. Um, also, if you consider a topological space, you can consider um, open sets on that. And these two is uh, a commutative order monoid. If you consider um, uh, this, particular uh, commutative monoid, which is uh, introduced by Lovier. So you take the closed interval zero to infinity with reverse order and uh, addition and the zero. And actually, this, it's true that every commutative unital quantile is a commutative order monoid. And so in particular, every complete aiding algebra. And actually, they're also uh, bounded and complete. Um, and I'll give you what it means in the, in the context of the unit interval. So you can define kind of this right adjoint to multiplication which would be some weird sort of uh, division. Um, so we say that the internal arm of uh, M and N is the minimum of the fraction. Uh, and we can define this fraction to be uh, exactly one when M is zero. And of course, in a quantile, you can just use the, the soup of the, the of the set. All right, so we now know what structure do we need on our unit interval. Now we need to go from this structure to sets with values in this structure. So the category I'm talking about is sometimes called set M, and these are sometimes called fuzzy sets. You have many, many possible categories of fuzzy sets, but what I mean by this is just a set with evaluation um, taking values into the, into the underlying set of the monoid. And morphisms are just functions that preserve the order. So um, very easy. And in the context, for example, if we consider M to be our unit interval, it just means that every set has a particular value attached to it. So we have a set, and we can kind of think of these as a membership degree or something. So we started from this, and now we're here. So we have something kind of being our fuzzy values, and we have something will be our fuzzy types. But I've been talking about type theory, so I need to kind of detail how do we go, uh, how do categories relate to type theory, and how can we can use that to do uh, fuzzy types as we have been trying to do. So there is um, um, you know, it's a close co correspondence between type theories and set categories, and I'll explain this in a while, but our claim is that, well, okay, so if we want to do fuzzy type theories, we just use set M categories. And so we kind of do it backwards this time. So I'm gonna tell you what happens in the first line, and then we give a categorical definition, and inside the definition, we read this new type theory that we need. Yes. Yes, sorry. Um, all right, so we enrich the category, read the type theory, find the theory that we need. All right, so enriching. So actually both M and set M support a monoidal structure so we can use them to enrich stuff. Um, in particular, set M will be the one that we're interested in. And so we can, the monoidal product of two um, M sets is as the underlying um, product of the sets and as the value, the product of the single valuations. Um, and um, um, the i is simply the, the singleton with constant one. 
So it's very, very easy structure. This means that we can use it as an enrichment. So for example, what happens, um, we can enrich, well, I mean, the, the structure on M is quite trivial, I think. So for example, if we can enrich in two, but this is just very simply um, kind of an order-like situation. Um, we can enrich in I, this is also not what we need. So this is maybe why we need to use M sets and we cannot use M straight because this is just kind of um, an order, but the, the order has some value alpha. This is not what we need. We need to be able to have multiple values um, relating to different uh, objects. And in particular, I, I, I said that L was introduced by Lovier and when you're reaching L, these are called Lovier matrix spaces. And you can see that actually the composition that I'll describe it will be just some um, triangle inequality. But let's look into the one that we need. So when we enrich in set M, what we find is that we can do some composition and that composition has to respect the order. So basically the product of the values is below, um, I mean, the, the value of the composite is above the, the product of the single evaluations. And of course, the identity has value one. All right, so now to the relation between categories and types. So I'm, I'm gonna use the, the notion of display map categories. There are many, but I think this is, the, like, this is the easiest to understand. It's the one that we use because it's very heavily um, map-based, uh, map let's say. So a display map category. So now we're back to uh, set and rich categories. So a map category is a pair, CD, with, where C is a category, and D is a class of morphism called displays or projections, such that C as a terminal object, so that will be, think of this as our empty context. And then for each projection and each map, there exists a choice of a pullback of the projection along the map. And these you can think of as substitution. Um, this will be what we will look at very carefully too. And then D is closed under pre and post composition with isomorphism, which is just a technical result. So basically, um, what do we mean by this now, is now how do we relate a display map category to a type theory? So each projection would be a type in a context. And if you have a projection, you want to read the context of the, of the type, you just read the codomain. And terms will be interpreted to be sections of such projections. So for example, so in this case, we have PA, which is the type A. It's in context gamma because we read its codomain is gamma and S is just a section of the projection. So all terms will be collected as sections of the projections. And as I said, the substitution will be pulled back along the projections. So um, in, in the sense, we will of, often consider S above to be actually a section. And so this will be like substituting um, the term into the type that the, project, the vertical projection is in. All right. So now let's go back to our intuition and see what axioms do we need to put in this new category. So we can think, our point is to think of um, a single set M category to be an agent in our system. And then, as I said, a context would be like a collection, like an ordered collection of beliefs, each depending on the, one, on the ones before. A type would be thought of as a belief and a term would be a proof or a reason why we believe something. Now, we want beliefs to be definite, so we don't want fuzzy types, uh, but we want reasons to be fuzzy. So we want terms to be um, of some kind of uh, fuzzy value. So non-fuzzy types, but fuzzy terms. So this is where we give our definition. So a fuzzy display map category is a pair CD with C, a set M category, D, a class of morphisms, such that C as a terminal object. But now we cannot do pullbacks, we need to do weighted pullbacks. And I'm so glad that Luca thought about this because I don't have to now. Um, so we'll, we'll see that what it means in our context very briefly, but it just, it's the same definition, we're just in a rich setting and we substitute um, pullbacks with weighted pullbacks. And then, as I said, we need to ask that types are not fuzzy. So we ask that the value of each, each projection is the most possible value, so one. Okay, so sections. So we say that S is an alpha section of PA if it is a section and its value is at most, uh, at least alpha. 
So nothing interesting here. But this allows us to, to show our first rule. Um, so if we have that in context gamma, S as value, um, S is a proof of A with confidence alpha, then it's a proof of A with confidence all possible values below that. Not very interesting. But it's, it allows us to, to show that we can, you know, when we know something with at least some confidence, then we know it with also all lower confidences. So now I'm going to show you what happens with calculations in the case of the unit interval, but just because it's easier, you can always extend it. So weighted pullbacks. So I'm going to give like a very, very, very basic uh, explanation of what it means in our context. So basically, when we ask for a pullback, we ask of an object and two maps. So these are the data, such that for any other pair of maps, there exists a unique map in that direction. But now we need, we have uh, maps, and each map has a value. So first, oh, yes, what do we ask of the two maps that um, come, out, come out of the object we start from? And also, when we have another pair of maps with values gamma and delta, what will happen to the universal map induced by the, the universal property of the weighted pullback? And that will be something depending on alpha and beta, which are the datum, and then also gamma and delta will be part of the datum. Um, so as, um, as Luca was saying, if we only consider regular pullbacks, this is no use of us, because now when, whenever we substitute, everything collapses to one. So we need to pick interesting weights. And interesting weights will be that that appear in the, in the, um, in the span on, on top of the, um, of the maps of alpha and beta value. All right, so there is something here, um, weighted pullbacks. I'll tell you what happens in our case. So we ask that the, um, the weights are actually just preserving the value. So whenever we pull back a map of value alpha, we want to be, to be able to find a map that is at least value alpha, because we want our substitution to be conservative in some sense. And then if we have maps S and T of value gamma and delta, of course, the, the right adjoint will come, come back again. And you can do some calculation and see that the, the, the definition of the weighted pool but gives you this property. So we have that the value of the universal map would be uh, the minimum of one gamma over beta and delta over alpha. So kind of looks nice. And now, finally, to the rules. Yes, I have still, still 10 minutes. So these are our rules for fuzzy type theory. So as I promised, we do we give this definition and we read into the category some rules. So first, let me show you what the rules are, and then I show you how they can be interpreted. Where do they come from in our in our category? So we have our empty context. We have the um, context extension. So that is pretty easy because if each time you have a projection, you do have a codomain, but you also have a domain, and that domain as an, is another context, and then context is the, the, the extended one. And then we have a variable rule. So I need to, to point something out here. So if we have a complex, uh, sorry, a context, gamma A delta, then we can always recover a certain term of type A, um, and this term will have uh, the outmost possible value. But this does kind of make sense. Notice also that there is something strange. Uh, at least I've been asked this a while. Um, so if you, if you see all uh, free variables appearing in contexts are not um, value, but the reason for that is that they're actually just objects while they're, what we're interested in is like the right hand side of the uh, turnstile symbol. So we're talking about judgments. So that is judgment with, uh, with um, actually certainty one. Uh, then we have our conservativity result. Then we have two weakening rules and two substitution rules. And uh, we can prove that a fuzzy display map category is sound and complete for the rules above. So I'll show you just a few ones. Um, so the variable rule. So remember that the variable rule is saying that out of a context, we, can, we want to be able to uh, get back a variable, so it would be a section, uh, and its value has to be one. But suppose we don't know that. Okay, so we start from, um, and for the, the purpose of this, we just consider 
the, the last, the delta to be just of a single type, but it's no problem if it's just a, you can see that it iterates very well. And also these were in pedantic because there are some subtleties here. Um, all right, so we have gamma, A, and B. So what it means is that gamma is a context, A is a type in context gamma, hence there is a projection PA from gamma dot A to gamma. <coughs> B is a type in context gamma um, A, so there is a projection PB from gamma dot A dot B into gamma dot A. And so we have some sort of situation like this, and now we want to be able to provide a section of, the, of this projection we have just described. So we do our pullback. Remember, it's a weighted pullback. And now we can paste the identity here and a projection here. You can see that it all commutes. Remember that projections have value one, so everything there has value one. And so we can find actually a section of the desired map. Now, <coughs> as I said, everything is one, so the value of this section is one. And now this is where I'm pedantic, because as you see, it is not really a section of gamma dot A dot B in the sense that the second A, now I need to point this, I'll try Andrea's method, I don't know, yes. This second A, this second A is actually not the same A as this one because they have different contexts, right? So you can see that this A is in context gamma and this A is in context gamma A B, all right? So there'll be two different projections. And so this is what I wrote down here. But usually most people don't, don't care about this because it's kind of the same type still. And the reason is that these is actually a, a weighted pullback and we can provide a section of this kind. Substitution, okay. You'd see that it kind of works in a similar way. So now we have a type B in context gamma A B. Ah, sorry, gamma A delta. Uh, so it means that we have iterated projections that tower up in this way. And we have a term of this, um, a term little a of type big A, and this is, has now value alpha. So we want to be able to substitute and find B of A in context gamma delta A. Again, this is just an iteration of pullbacks. Because first we do that substitution, we find, find the context that we need, and now we need to find this type B. So it's clear that the type B will be here. I'm not tall enough, but you can imagine where it is. Uh, because that is now the, on the lower part, you can see that you have the correct context. And actually, you can compute it. Um, also, no, I'll, I'll talk about it later. Okay, last substitution for terms. Um, again, this is a situation where we're at, but now we have also a term uh, B, little b, in that context. <coughs> and now we do need to do some calculations, right? Um, so we have little a that has value at least alpha because it's an alpha section. And then when we pull it back, we find that the value increases. Um, and now we kind of use a similar technique consider the identity, um, consider the lower part of the, the composition of the two. And again, we find a section of the desired uh, projection. Now, we want to be able to tell what value it is, but with this, we just need to do a computation. And we find that actually uh, the value is above beta. So it means, oh, sorry. So it means that out of, so when we substitute there, we find a new term and its confidence will be still the same. Um, and I know there may be a question about this, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, yes, no, I'll do it now, yes. Okay, that's it. Um, so I've been asked, oh, there's many slides here. Okay, yes. Um, I've been asked, isn't it weird that, you know, the confidence still is the same through all, throughout all these structural rules? And actually, as Francesco was, uh, we were discussing it uh, a few weeks back, and it actually is not because there are structural rules. 
we're not supposed to, they're not supposed to change our confidence in anything. We're just combining stuff, but not really doing anything. So it's okay that the confidence is preserved. Of course, now we want to extend this theory to involve uh, connectives and uh, type constructors. So that, that will change actually the confidence, of course. Um, but it, it, it makes sense that these don't change in our, in our theory. All right, let me back, get back to the end. Uh, uh, um. But yes, back to our interpretation. So a Selam category is an agent. A context is a set of beliefs. A typing context is a belief. And a term is a, a proof of the belief. But now we, have, we can read more into our category. So for example, we can read maps from one to C with confidence the top element to be kind of tautologies because they come out of the term, terminal object with the most confidence. And so these will be the things that we can interpret to be tautologies. If we have another object and things, we can go, go out of, of that with, again, the outermost confidence, we can interpret them to be facts that can be deduced or uh, by C, by E, sorry. And then if we weaken it, uh, so we can interpret arrows that go out of E, stands for evidence in our mind, um, with confidence alpha, you can think of them as things that can be deduced by E with confidence, at least alpha. All right, so what next? We need to deal with definitional equality. It's not a small problem. We have a few ideas. I can tell you about that if you're interested. Then we, can, we need to cite, study constructors and the connectives. Um, see what happens when we, because we have this general definition, but it might be interesting to consider what happens when you change when you actually interpret M to be different, like for example, as the L introduced by Lavier. And then finally, I promise you opinion dynamics. So there is uh, some work by Ansen and Gerst that do, does this with sheaves. So uh, we just, but we need to, to extend our theory to, to include this as well. And uh, yes, so some references, and I want to, um, just add that, as I mentioned, this is a part of the uh, Joint School Project, and it's a school for uh, students and PhD students. So if you're interested, be careful because the, the deadline is January 9th. So maybe if you know, if you yourself are interested or if you have any questions, come up. And I, I think it's a, it's a nice opportunity for students. I'm done. So thanks, Greta, for the nice talk. So is there any question? Thank you. Really, really interesting talk. Um, my question is, is this different slash related to quantitative type theory? Because it has the same like decoration on judgment, on typing judgments with elements in a monoid. And it seems the typing rules are really um, similar. I don't know about that, but the person that suggested this project does so i think I, I need to study more about it but if you have any any anything that i can read on it of course all right thank you thanks for the talk so uh i have two questions actually but maybe i start with the first one uh so uh i guess there are other choices for the arrows of set m uh, yes so what happens uh, <laughs> with these other choices? Like if you take the other inequality, for example, or the strict equality, like the preservation of the valuation. Yes. So what, what happens when you reverse the order? For example, like have you tried to see? Um, OK, so I think, um, I think the thing is that you want deduction to be conservative. So when you do something to your judgment, you don't want it to. Uh, be less informative than before. So I think it could work, but it, it goes in the in the wrong direction for the deduction in some sense. As for maybe you're thinking about functional relations, that is something that we're looking into because uh, as I mentioned, uh, we need to find a way to, to do uh, definitional equality. And so the, the, the most obvious choice, at, at least to me, would be to have sets which will also um, um, the, um, the equality predicate to be unvalued. And so you need to change your arrows. And so it changes things a bit. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, thank you. 
Um, and the second question is about the universe. Have you considered what happens when you have a, I mean, if you want to introduce a universe? Because in that case, the types becomes terms. Terms. Yeah. And, I and think so they become fuzzy. Or yes, actually, uh, I, we have we had quite a discussion about this because I too believe that uh, types should be fuzzy. Um, um, so it's really it, it doesn't do much in our theory that you ask that. I mean, it doesn't change uh, a lot about our interpretation if you consider fuzzy projections. So it's it's not really a problem. Um, the thing is that when you do, of course, when you do pullbacks, you want to have some kind of pullback pasting property. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the case of weighted limits, the composition should, should be kind of conditional to the fact that you can compose the pullbacks. So that changes a bit. But other than that, uh, it's, uh, it's, it works fine, I think. Yeah, yeah also uh, just a last comment. I yeah. think that your substitution rule for types would be more natural if you allow the types to be fast. I agree with well. you completely. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Jacopo. So, if there are no more questions, so I, I asked one just because I am curious. Yeah. Uh, so, have you any idea of how difficult it is uh, adding uh, uh, fuzzy assumptions in your context? Huh. Because, I mean, my understanding of a context is the beliefs of an agent. So, yeah. I think it's reasonable to have uh, fuzzy beliefs of an agent. Um. Mm. It's a good question. Um, I think this is probably not the easiest way to do it, but I think it should work. If you use double categories, um, but I, I, I've, I've been trying to read about enriched double categories and it's not, not very easy. Um, but if you do use double categories, in some sense, you can keep the two together. So you can kind of have some identity map and you, you can take the value of that identity map to be um, the kind of the, the fuzzy value of the, of the premise of the context. Because now you have a map between a context and itself, right? And this is allowed because you have some kind of uh, or horizontal or vertical direction. And so you, you still have maps. They can be valued. Um, and you can consider the value of the identity as the value of the premise in some sense. But uh, I'm not sure this is the easiest way. And we haven't thought about it, no. Okay, thanks. And Thank no more questions? Sorry, I can't resist asking this. Um, so you interpret the internal home as this like minimum of the fraction in one, mm -hmm. I think in the interval poset, right? Yeah, it's not an interpretation. It's like the right adjoint to the multiplication. Right, because there's also this thing that zero one is isomorphic to like infinity zero, so zero infinity the other way yeah. through logarithm. Yeah. Does that give you this same thing? Uh, I think so too. All right, cool. Thank you. Okay, so I think we stop here. <laughs> so it's time for lunch. Uh, I think it is an at the first floor, I'm right. Uh, okay. We don't know. Right, well. The organizers is here. Thank you. Okay. Same place of the coffee break. Okay, it is at, at the same place of the of the coffee break. So, and resume at 2 p.m. Right. So thanks, great again, and stop here. <laughs> <laughs>